We, all right, so we got through this marks, I don't know, maybe the second time all quarter that I've managed to get all of your quizzes graded before the first lecture. It only took me having two extra days in the week to do that, but um, so I got through everybody's questions. And so there's a couple good relevant questions um, and a couple random ones. Uh, carbon se sequestration was brought up, which is the idea that the to sequester something means to take it and isolate it from everything else. So carbon sequestration is, is um, a method of combating climate change, um, where you basically directly pull CO2 out of the atmosphere and squirrel it away somewhere. Um, the problem is, is that the atmosphere is really, really big. Even though it's not as dense as, as the Earth, it's got way more mass, there's way more CO2 in the atmosphere than we could realistically sequester if we just started doing things like pulling CO2 directly out of the air and putting it in CO2 tanks. Um, but there are a lot of, of uh, potential ways to, to do this that have been talked about. Um, for instance, you can take calcium oxide and when you expose it to CO2, it becomes calcium carbonate, um, which is insoluble in water and basically it's limestone chalk. So you could in theory take calcium oxide that's in the crust of the earth expose it to enough CO2 that you turn it into limestone and then basically um, keep carbon you know, sequestered away that way. That still would be really, really monumental to get that done at any sort of scale where it would actually affect climate change because we're talking about hundreds of millions of tons of CO2. Um, one, of the, one of the ideas that's actually the most realistic one I've ever heard um, is it involves um, government subsidies to farms that prove that they have a higher carbon content in their soil um, than they did when they entered the program. So basically you enter a program, government inspector comes out, takes samples of your soil on your farm and soil naturally has a certain amount of carbon in it in the form of decomposing organic material. Um, so basically that's what makes soil black and fertile is having lots of organic material there. Um, and so when you, if you treat the land properly, you can increase that amount of carbon that, that's in your soil. Um, and if we have so much arable land that's being farmed on our planet, if, if we had a couple of the largest agricultural countries have some sort of subsidy that rewarded farmers for treating their, for improving their own soil. So it's really win-win for the farmers. Um, and then we could actually start making a dent in terms of the amount of CO2 that's in the air. But basically anything that happens is gonna have to be at a scale where we're talking about some of the largest governments or the UN as a whole having to in enact some of these, these policies. Otherwise it's just not, these, these techniques require too much um, money to, to put into place by any one individual. It almost has to be done at the policy level. Um, which is why environmental policy is such a big field right now and why it's so important. Um, somebody asked about my least favorite aspect of chemistry, um, which is a new one. I've never had that one before. Um, and I had to think about it for a second. And I have to say, it's probably maintaining a chemistry stock room. I hate the logistics involved with needing to plan out next year's labs a whole year in advance and plan and order the chemicals and handle budgeting and purchasing orders and stuff like that. Um, because it can take us six months to eight months to get a chemical sometimes. Um, because of one, it can take a month just to get anything, just to get something with two day delivery from Amazon. It can take a month just to go through the purchasing procedures and things like that. And when you factor in the fact that these chemical supply companies are shipping from all over the world and sometimes they have a back of the six months before they can even produce the chemical that we're ordering, it can take a really, really long time to get stuff. And I'm, you guys know by now, I don't think ahead more than, you know, if I'm lucky a week in advance, let alone eight months in advance. Um, so that's my least favorite part is trying to keep on top of that. So luckily I have some people that help me stay on top and organize there. Uh,
Um, if we don't eat all day, I thought that was a good question. What happens when we don't eat all day? Basically your body switches over from burning sugar in your bloodstream and turning sugar into ATP by way of, of taking oxygen and it converts the sugar and oxygen into CO2 and it generates ATP as it does that. It's the same net result as burning the sugar, but it does it in lots of small steps um, to produce ATP. And the, the actual process is really fascinating. It's one of my favorite parts of biochemistry is the electron transport chain, that the actual mechanism by which it turns, um, oxidizes carbon, and in doing so, turns it into ATP in the individual cells um, in the mitochondria. Um, if you don't eat all day, then basically your body doesn't, it still needs to maintain a certain level of, of blood sugar in your bloodstream Otherwise, your brain can't function. Your brain only works on, ox on uh, sugar. So basically, your liver is almost entirely fatty tissue. And basically, your liver starts breaking down fatty acids that it has stored and turning that into some of the same molecules that sugars get broken down into. But the problem is it makes other byproducts along the way. Um, and so you can wind up, anybody who's on, a, on an extremely low um, low carb diet or zero carb diet has the same issues where your body will break down fats, but is not as efficient at breaking down fats for energy as its exclusive energy source as it is at breaking down sugars. Um, so you wind up with other byproducts um, building up over the course of the day um, or longer term, if anybody's heard of ketosis. Um, people that are that go like extreme paleo diets or have zero carbs, um, they wind up going into what's called ketosis, where basically your body starts making these molecules called ketone bodies um, as a byproduct of trying to keep breaking down fats um, to keep the uh, the process of making ATP going. Um, and one of those byproducts is uh, acetone. And if you have if you have anybody that you know that has gone on a really really extreme zero carb diet for a period of at least a week or more, um, you can actually smell acetone on their breath. Um, it's not very healthy to do that long term. Um, is it healthier than being obese? Maybe. It depends on your own personal, you know, history or uh, medical history and things like that and just how extreme we're talking about. Um, but it's the sim same process that takes over once you, if you just don't eat anything, if you fast all day, you have a similar process happening where your body sort of switches over and starts breaking down fatty acids to make acetyl-CoA instead of breaking down sugar to make acetyl-CoA. Um, I, I always get lots of questions about curing cancer. Will scientists ever be able to cure cancer? Uh, treat? Yeah, we already treat cancer and with pretty good success for some forms of cancer. Um, can we limit how often it happens? We're getting better at that, at figuring out what carcinogens are out there and what's really important to avoid and what's not. Um, can we ever cure it? Not really. Everybody will get cancer at some point. It's just a matter of what form and whether it's one of the treatable ones. Um, and if you're lucky, frankly, uh, at this point, in theory, they, there could be some some technology that evolved that develops in the future that make that really makes treatment of cancers, you know, more like a 99% success or our treatment rate versus um, where we currently are. Um, but it's unlikely that we'll ever be able to completely eliminate cancer entirely from happening because it's basically your body is cells that are constantly dividing. Um, and anytime cells divide, there's a possibility that there's a transcription error. And when that happens, you can wind up with a mutation. 90% of mutations don't have any effect on your body. Um, about the other 9.9 .9 of them are going to be things that cause cancer. And then there's a like a 0.01% chance that you actually have some mutation that is visible in some way or is measurable in some way. Your body starts producing a different version of melanin, your hair color changes or something like that. Um, or like more likely you have one hair follicle that has slightly different hair color than the other hair follicles around it because that one has a, a mutation. Um, but the nature of how things live and break down oxygen means you're gonna get cancer at some point. It's just 
a matter of when and how bad and where. Um, so it's all about limiting and you know, playing the odds there. You know, don't do anything that dramatically increases your odds of getting one of the bad ones like lung cancer. Uh, let's see. Do compounds involving noble, gas, noble gases exist? If so, where and what are they? Not naturally, because basically you have to have something that's extremely electronegative to, in order to, to steal electrons away from noble gases enough to form a covalent bond. So basically, noble gases will form compounds with fluorine. Um, the only time this has ever been observed is actually a, a chemist who um, worked with fluorine a lot. One of his students actually trapped some fluorine gas in a little glass bulb with some xenon. Um, as a filler and then just sealed it and gave it to his instructor as like a you know a gift or something like that and he kept it on his desk um, and eventually what he noticed is that there was a little white solid forming on the inside of this sealed container that was nothing but xenon and fluorine um, where there should be nothing no solid should form because there's nothing to react with the fluorine other than a noble gas but it turns out if you expose a noble gas, especially one of the ones lower on the periodic table to a to fluorine, you can wind up forming things like um, xenon, I believe that one was xenon tetrafluoride. But you can also form xenon hexafluoride or xenon difluoride where you basically force the xenon to share more than it wants to because the fluorine is so good at pulling electrons towards itself. Um, so it can happen, they're just, just not really in nature on earth. Um, in theory, if there happened to be a gas giant that was entirely you know, noble gases mixed together with some helium in there, you could find it on that planet, but that'd be a pretty rare planet to have um, occur anyway because the, you know, the noble gases, especially the heavier ones, just don't show up that often in, in most astronomical settings. And then two good questions about balancing reactions. Um, if you balance a reaction and you wind up with something like 2A plus 6B goes to 4C and 2D, can it be assumed since they're all divisible by two, you can simplify it that way? Yeah, in fact, you should, because if you balance a reaction and you come up with all even coefficients, that means that you didn't balance it quite right. You went through the process right, maybe, but there was a simpler way. We always want the lowest whole number of coefficients that we can have. So anytime you wind up with all of your coefficients that are divisible by the same number, you can reduce it like you're reducing a fraction. Just divide everything by two and it should still be balanced if it was balanced in the first place. Um, and so that's actually the most, the most common way we see this is if, is all even numbers, but in theory, if you balanced it and everything was divisible by three, you could, should divide everything by three to simplify it. Um, but the easiest one to, pay, to keep an eye out for is anytime you balance a reaction, you get all even integers, you should divide them by, um, by two, because it'll still be balanced when you do that, if it was balanced in the first place. Um, does it matter if we start from the products and finish with react reactants when it's balanced? Not really. In fact, in a lot of cases, if you, when you take Gen Chem especially, we'll talk about equilibrium reactions and we'll find out that defining reactants versus products is kind of arbitrary anyway, because every reaction that happens forward can also happen backward. So what we call reactants and products is really just a matter of semantics and what's convenient given the, the situation we're in. So if you ever wind up, if it seems easier, like, oh, I'm gonna balance this over here first instead of that. Yeah, that's fine. As long as you end up with it balanced, it doesn't really matter what route you take to get there. And so whatever makes the most sense to you. And speaking of balancing, um, if when you were balancing reactions on the quiz over the weekend, some of you might've noticed that um, knowing the charges of your ions and your polyatomic ions still winds up being important, right? If I say zinc nitrate, you kind of have to have the formula correct on zinc nitrate in order to balance the whole reaction properly, right? So the, the problem I'm talking about in particular is one that said zinc nitrate reacts with lithium metal. 
If you don't know that zinc has a plus two and nitrate is minus one, then you wouldn't want to have written this formula right, which means when you write the products, okay, lithium nitrate and zinc, balancing this is not going to go very well if you don't know the charges, right? So again, we had sort of a light week this week in terms of we didn't have class, we don't have lab. Um, use this as an opportunity to make sure that you're caught up on, on knowing your polyatomic ions and your charges on everything because that's going to keep coming back. Getting the right formulas is really important for balancing. And balancing is really important for stoichiometry. These things just keep building on themselves. Now it's balanced, right? But if you thought zinc had a plus one charge, then you're not going to get to the right spot at the end. All right, so let's, I also got several questions about how do we do number four? And we'll do number four, which had different amounts of both of these starting materials. Um, but I'm going to approach it a little bit by kind of giving us some more vocabulary for thinking about this. Um, if we have limited amounts of both reactants in a reaction, that means pretty much by definition, one of them has going to run out first. It's possible that everything's just perfectly measured out and everything's going to run out at the same exact time. Um, but in general, you're going to have something left over and something that you're running out of. Right. So this is another good case of uh, a food analogy works. If we, if you have a, um, a barbecue for 45 people and you go out and you buy a whole bunch of hamburger patties and a whole bunch of buns, the odds are that you get the exact right number of ham hamburger patties to buns is pretty low, right? You're almost always going to have something left over and something running out first. Whatever runs out first, we call the limiting reactant. Right? So that's, I mean, the name kind of makes sense. Whatever is running out first is what's limiting how many times the reaction can happen. It's limiting how much product you can make. And so this is the most common mistake on number four was not thinking through the logic of this and realizing that if you have two different reactants and you have an amount for each of them, they're both being used up at the same time. When you make a hamburger to serve, you're using one patty and one bun, not one and then the other, right? If I have 30 patties and 45 buns, I can't make 75 hamburgers, right? You can't just add them together because they're being used up together. So in this case, if we already have it in moles, it becomes fairly easy to see what's going out, going on here. Um, in this case, what's gonna run out first? How could we show that? Any thoughts? If you're good with mental arithmetic, you might just be able to look at it and see. And what's going to run out first? What's the limiting reactant for this right here? And why do you say that? So you, just that we have less of it. That's your, that's everybody's first instinct, and it's a good first instinct, except we're not using them at the same rate. We're actually using more iron for every time this reaction happens than we are oxygen. And this isn't a particularly kind ratio. Four to three is a tricky ratio to think about. But basically, you're using 33% more iron than oxygen. So O2 is the right answer, but we have to be able to, sh to show why that is. You can't just say, well, there's less of it, therefore we run out of it first. You can have, to go back to our, our car analogy, if you're using four wheels for every one engine, you could have fewer engines and still run out of doors. Sorry, wheels, whatever my analogy was. I'm mixing and matching analogies. It's not, not usually a good thing. Um, so how do we show this? 
we show it by using stoichiometry, just the same way we, we did before. We say, okay, let's say I have two moles of iron. If it's a balanced reaction, we can still do this conversion of moles of iron to moles of something else. We can just convert to the other reactant. Right? So we can say, okay, well, every time I use four moles of iron, I also use three moles of oxygen. Now it doesn't matter that we don't actually have four moles because what's important is the ratio, right? And what this will tell us, we'll wind up with moles of iron canceling out and just be left in moles of oxygen used. We wind up with what, 1.5? So what this is saying is that if we used up all of our iron, we would also use up 1.5 moles of oxygen. How does that square with what we have written with what our actual situation is? We only have one mole. If using up all of the iron means using up more oxygen than we actually have, we can't do that. We can't use up all the iron in that case, right? If we have less oxygen than the iron needs, then we're gonna have leftover iron. If we have 45 buns and 30 patties, we're gonna have leftover buns, right? Using up all 45 buns would require all 45 patties, which we don't have. So the fact that using up all of our iron means using more oxygen than we have means the oxygen runs out first. This is the trickiest part here is you have to think about the logic of what each of these things is saying and wrap your head around the logistics of it. Um, basically, I can't just give you a memorize this procedure to do this math problem for this because it would have an if then statement in it because there's two possibilities. Either the iron runs out first or the oxygen runs out first. And you can't just memorize one procedure to go through it. Right? You have to think about the logic. If we, what if we said, if we wrote it the other way, if we said, okay, let's use up all of our oxygen. We can still do the same calculation basically and say, okay, well, every three moles of oxygen, means four moles of iron used. Moles of oxygen cancels out and you get four over three, right? Or 1.33 moles of iron used. That's less than what we actually have, right? So to use up all of our oxygen would require 1.33 moles of iron, which we have. Basically, when you do this, one of these is always going to be, is always going to, one of these two cases is always going to happen. You're either going to calculate more moles needed than you actually have, which means the other thing is running out first, or when you calculate it, you get less moles than you actually have, which means this is what's running out first, right? If you have, if you have enough patties to make 30 hamburgers and you have enough buns to make 45 hamburgers, you're gonna make, you can make 30 hamburgers, right? Which is one more way that you can, you can write this. I'm going to give you three different ways of thinking about this because different people have different different logic sticks with different people better. So, in our hamburger analogy, this was using buns to figure out how many patties get used, and this is using patties to figure out how many buns get used. The other way of doing it is saying, okay, 
figure out how much product I can make with both of them. And whichever number is less is our real number. If you have enough patties to make 45 burgers and you have enough buns to make 30 burgers, you can only make 30 burgers. Right? You're not going to add them together at the end. You're going to pick whatever number is smallest. So if we say, okay, I have 2.0 multiplier. And every four moles of iron can make two moles of product, iron three oxide. Yeah, we have enough iron to make one mole of product. Or, this is the key, it's an or, not an and. We could use up all of our oxygen. And every three moles of oxygen is two moles of product. So we had 0 0.6, right? 0 0.67. <laughs> Moles, iron three oxide. So which of those is the right number? Whichever amount is less, that has to be the real number, right? We have enough oxygen to make this much. We have enough iron to make this much. Which means we can only make the smaller amount. And I'm going to say this again, the temptation is always for people to add these two numbers together. You can't do that. Because it's not like you're adding up or you're making, using the iron up and then you're using up the oxygen. You're using both of them at the same time. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you're using both of them at the same time, only one of these can be true. And it has to be the smaller number. So the only way this concept gets any trickier is if I don't give it to you in moles, right? If you have to get two moles first and then figure out what runs out first. Remember, none of these stoichiometry steps work with mass. You have to start by taking mass and converting it to moles. And then you can use the coefficient to do this. Um, the other vocab term that we use is we have limiting reactant. And limiting reactant, we're always assuming it's going to be completely gone at the end. We're using up all of one of my options which means you're going to have some amount of excess reactant. An excess reactant is just what you have left over. It's the buns that you still have left after you make all the hamburgers, right? So excess reactant, it's just a matter of understanding what that term is asking for. If you want to know how many moles of excess reactant we have, how would we calculate that mathematically? Close. We're, we are going to still multiply. We're going to still going to use stoichiometry. I just erased the part that has the answers, or that that would make sense here. Um, if we say, okay, oxygen is our limiting reactant, so one mole of oxygen is going to react, and every time three moles of oxygen reacts. Four moles of iron reacts is used. So we get 1.33 moles of iron used. It's actually even simpler. If you have this number, using up all of our oxygen means 1.33 moles of iron are 
going to be used. We have more than that, right? So how much iron is left if we're using this much? It's just a subtraction. If you know what you start with and you know how much is used, the difference is what's left over. If I start with 45 hamburger buns and I use 30 of them to make hamburgers, how many buns do I have left? 45 minus 30, right? What you have minus what you used. So 2.0 moles of iron initially minus 1.3. Big, big wise, we want to drop that second one. Moles of iron used. So 0 0.7 moles iron left or excess. Uh, our abbreviation for excess is just X and S. So basically all these stoichiometry problems are based are logistics problems. What do I have? What's being used? How much can I make? It's just a matter of getting the ratio right and having everything in moles. All right, so with all this in mind, thinking about limiting reactants, I guess we'll do one more, one more definition here. Um, the maximum amount of product that you could make based on what you start with is called the theoretical yield. So it's given our starting conditions and assuming everything goes perfectly, nothing is lost to waste or the reaction goes 100% to product, as far as we can go, how much product could you make? That's what, that's all that is meant by the term theoretical yield. So what's the theoretical yield in moles of this reaction? I'll give you a hint. It's already written on the board. Two. Is that from the coefficient? Close, but we didn't actually have enough for it to react a, a whole mole of times, right? 0.67. We have enough iron to make one mole of product. We have we only have enough oxygen to make 0.67 moles of product. Therefore, this is how many we could actually make. If we started with four moles of iron and three moles of oxygen then our theoretical yield would be two. Right? But if we don't actually have the same number of moles as our coefficients to start with, we're not actually going to make coefficient work of problem. And so this whole section is basically, here's some new vocab terms, new ways to thinking, think about the same sort of arithmetic problems that you learned in third grade, right? This is literally how they teach subtraction in second grade. I happen to know having a second grader. You start with this many postage stamps. Timmy comes by and takes three of those postage stamps. How many postage stamps do you have left? That's all this is really, right? We're just representing it in a cleaner way. And it's not always one-to-one. -one. Right? So, it, but the logic of it it's the same thing. And this is, these are the terms that we're using, theoretical yield, excess reactants. How do you know that two moles of So that, that came from just looking at the coefficient and saying, so we don't actually have two moles. So if you want to know what, like, you mean how many moles of, of reactant here to start with? No, but like there you have, you have two, two more zero moles of iron. Mm -hmm. Now you have four moles of iron. So that just comes from the balanced reaction. 
when you balance the reaction, the whole point of balancing it was conservation of mass, right? If you start with this many iron atoms, here's how many product molecules you can make just by counting atoms. And that, once it's balanced, that's where we get these conversions. Right, that's our, our meals per car analogy. If you if we try to do to do a reaction that wasn't balanced, none of this works. Just like if you tried to figure out how many wheels were going to get used up, but you, you you balance it with five wheels per car instead of four wheels per car, your numbers aren't going to work, right? Nothing is going to make any sense if you do if you don't have a balance to start with. All right. So with that in mind, with all these terms. Let's, I'm just going to put the um, problem, problem four from the quiz up on the board. And I want everybody to work through it until everybody gets the right answer. And then we'll work through it as a group. You already have that written down. If you've already done some of the work, you can either figure out where you went wrong or you can start from a blank piece of paper and make sure that you can still get to this, the right answer. If you got it right, make sure that you got it right for the right reason, that you didn't just pick one of the two reactants and go with that and got lucky, because um, that is a possibility here, right? If you don't know what's going to run out first and you just picked one of them and went with that, you might get a 50-50 chance of guessing the right limiting reactant. But make sure you got the right answer for the right reason, because I grade you on that. On the final, you can get the right answer and still be marked down if you didn't show which one was the limiting reactant. While you're working on this, I'm going to go see if I can find a way in over there so I can stop using the chop saw hole in class. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Message has not been passed along yet, clearly. Problem is, I can't just walk through over there because that door is locked. I have no idea how they're getting upstairs and in, into that area because I don't know where the other staircases that they might be using to get over there. Anyway, um, if we want to figure out how much product we can make, so this is a, a theoretical yield question. It doesn't use the word theoretical yield. It says how much product, how much zinc metal can we make from this reaction? It says how many grams? So this is the way I always organize things. Once I have my balanced chemical reaction written out, I write down what I have to start with and what I'm trying to calculate to sort of organize which way I'm gonna go. Because there are a lot of different things we can calculate for, at this point, right? There's a lot of different sort of geometry conversions we could use. There's tons of conversions we could do. So we want to make sure we're doing calculations that make sense. And the way to do that is, um, at least for me, is to keep things organized. Okay, so if I start with 1.50 grams of lithium and 31.25, grams of zinc nitrate, and I want to know how many grams of zinc metal I can make. Anytime you have a stoichiometry problem, remember none of our stoichiometry works with grams. So the very first thing you have to do is put everything in moles. So we can start by saying, you guys made it out before I told you oh, to yes. turn back around. Yes. You booked it out of here. I don't blame you. Um, if we're going to start by 
by turning this into moles. Sorry, I didn't realize anybody made it out before I turned everybody around. Start by turning grams into moles by just using molecular weight. So 31.25 grams of zinc nitrate. And we just use the atomic or the uh, molecular weight there. So one zinc plus two nitrogens plus six oxygens. Six times 16 is what? 96 plus 28. I'm not going to do the rest of this in my head. I don't remember zinc off the top of my head anyway. Who has this number? 189.4. Thank you. <laughs> So when we go through this process, we wind up with something around what 0.5? No, 0.05. What do we get? Maybe 0.005? No, point. <clears throat> Calculator around here somewhere. 165. All right, so then I just rewrite this right underneath what we already have. Keep track of moles of what? We do the same procedure with lithium. Lithium's got a molecular weight of around seven, so we should wind up with something like a quarter, right? Something right around 0.25. What is the Adding up zinc plus nitrogen, zinc plus two nitrogens plus six oxygens. So just using the molecular weight from the periodic table. Lithium's even easier because it's just lithium. Which again is, I'm pretty sure. Times two. No, good question. The coefficient is saying how, when this reacts, how many lithium atoms there are, but it doesn't mean that one molecule has two lithiums in it. So don't, the coefficients don't affect the um, molecular weight, right? Because it doesn't matter what reaction zinc nitrate is in. What the balancing is, zinc nitrate has the same molecular weight no matter what. So just one lithium. So 1.50 grams of lithium is 7.08 or something like that. Molecular weight of lithium? Uh, 6.94. 6.94. Mm -hmm. So 1.5 over 7. Two one seven. Two one six. Two and six. Sorry, I thought you said six nine. Cool. So this is all just setting up the problem. But if we do this all sequentially, it's going to make everything make more sense. So now, how do we know what's going to run out first? Not in this case, because we're using up twice the lithium twice as fast because it's a two to one ratio, right? So we would need twice as much lithium as zinc, as the zinc nitrate. And we don't have twice as much. If you can't see that map in your head, do this approach. Use both of these to figure how much zinc metal you can make and what take the smaller number. So 0 0.5 
0.165 moles of zinc nitrate. And for every one mole of zinc nitrate, it's one mole of zinc. So we have enough zinc nitrate to make 0.165 moles of product. Or we could use up all of our lithium, 0 0.216 moles lithium, and that's a two to one ratio. For every two moles of lithium, you can make one mole of product. So 0 0.108. They can't both be true, and we're not adding them up. So the smaller number has to be true. We only have enough lithium to make this much product. To put it in another way, lithium is our limiting reactant. And so it can be also be helpful to just go through and when you're writing this, once you figure out what you're running out of first with the limiting reactant is, label it so you don't forget what's running out first. Now, it doesn't really matter how much, if you know that lithium is running out first, it doesn't matter how much zinc nitrate we have. All that matters is that we have enough that lithium is running out first, right? I don't care if you have 45 hamburger buns or 400 hamburger buns, if you only have 30 patties. Right? There we are. We know that this is how many moles of product we can make. If we want grams of product, we do another molecular weight. Zinc is one mole of zinc is what, 65? And you come up with either six something high or seven something low grams. Seven point oh six is what I get. So I don't know why. Almost, almost half of the answers that I considered correct on the quiz had 6.9 or something like that. And I don't know what math was done to get to 6.9 instead of 7.1. Um, but clearly there's something systematically that people did differently um, than, than what we did here. Maybe it was just not rounding in between. Um, when you went from grams of lithium to moles of lithium, if you didn't round, you could have wound up with um, with uh, a different number at the end, still close enough for sig figs that I assume that you did the process right. That's a kind of a lot of writing for something that's a, kind of a pretty simple process, but showing your work is gonna keep you from doing things, from mixing things up, right? And writing out your units all the way, not just moles, but moles of what? Right, so that when you do moles and moles here, I left off moles here. So that when you do these conversions, you know what you're doing. And then once you have moles of zinc, that's the reminder to grab the right molecular weight. All right, one more vocab term for these. This is, these are all different parts of what we call a reaction study, which is basically all the different calculations that you could do based on the reaction in your starting materials. Um, a lot of times you don't actually make all of the, the product that you should be able to. And so you don't actually get 100% yield. And we've actually seen this, we did this in, 
We've kind of done percent error in lab. I don't think we've done a percent yield in lab. Um, percent yield is just what you actually made or what's, what your actual yield is divided by what you should have been able to make. So if we're making our own hamburger patties and we have, I don't know, 10 pounds of hamburger meat and we should be able to make 40 patties out of that, but we only actually make 35 patties because we're making them by hand or something like that. You don't have 100% yield there, right? That extra that was lost uh, is something we can calculate that percentage. It's just what you actually got divided by, by what you expected times 100. So in, for this reaction, since we've already, we still have our theoretical yield, we're not there. That looks backwards. That looks worse. That's probably right. So it's actual, and this is on your equation sheet, over expected or over theoretical times 100. So 0 0.5, if 0 0.5 is what we actually measured over 0 0.67, which was our theoretical times 100. That gives us seven eighths. Uh, eight, right. Does it matter if we're in moles or grams for percent yield? See. If Couple of people shaking their head. No, why not? Because our units cancel out, and we're talking about grams of the same substance. So if you have the same molecular weight for the moles on top and the moles on bottom, then grams divided by grams and moles divided by moles will give you the same answer. If it's not the same substance, you can't do that. You can't say grams of zinc metal divided by grams of zinc nitrate because they don't have the same molecular weight. So grams doesn't cancel out grams the same way. All right, so that's a, a bit of a sticking point, but as long as we're talking about the same substance, as long as we're talking about product and it's the same product, and it doesn't matter if you're in grams or in moles for percent yield. And that's, I don't want to say by far, but yeah, I'll say by far. That's by far the least important thing we've talked about today is, is percent yield. Theoretical yield, limiting reactant, excess reactant are way more important, right? And it all comes down to figure out what you've got, figure out how much you can make, and figure out what's getting used up. And if you just approach it that way, think of this systematically, what you're doing, don't let the fact that they're chemicals make it seem intimidating. It's hamburgers and hot dogs for all you care. Hamburgers and buns. I'm trying to keep my analogy straight. <laughs> all right, let's take a break. And I'm actually gonna go find somebody I can talk to this time without the fire alarm going off. So 10 minutes, let's come back at 10 after and, and uh, work on this problem.
Yeah, fewest number of sig figs. So just two.
All right, I think we've got most everybody back. So I've just started working through this and remember, so I, the very first thing you wanna do is make sure that it's balanced, All right? So if I have coefficients written in there for you, you can usually assume that I did it properly, but it's never a bad idea to spot check my work. So, but it does look like it's balanced, right? One titanium on each side, four fluorines on each side. Next thing you do, is take anything you have in grams and put it in moles. Especially if it doesn't specify what units for theoretical yield. Sometimes it'll say theoretical yield in grams. In which case you can leave the actual yield in grams anyway, because we have to get our theoretical yield into grams so that you don't necessarily need to go and convert the titanium four fluoride into um, into moles, but at the very least, we want our reactants in moles, right? So we just go through use the molecular weights. And when we do so, 2.4 over 47.867, we get 0. 0.0. .0 Five O moles of titanium. Just clearing this out of the way. And the coefficient two doesn't make a difference on the molecular weight, but the <laughs> subscript two does because the subscript is part of the molecule. So it's saying that one molecule has two fluorine atoms. So that does affect the molecular weight, which is why it's the atomic mass doubled down here. The 1.6 over 37.996, 0 0.42. Point zero four two, yeah. And just in the interest of consistency, I'll, I'm going to rewrite. That's not what I meant to do. If we want our theoretical yield in grams, so what's our limiting reactant in our excess reactant? Fluorine is limiting. We have less of it, and we're also using it up twice as fast. So you don't always need to show your work to, to get limiting reactants as long as you label it. I want that thing to go away. And give me some indication of how you know that. Show me that you didn't just guess. So you could say, 
we have less fluorine and we're using it up faster is enough, is showing your work. Or you can do the same thing we've been doing and use stoichiometry steps to show the math behind it. Um, since we have to cal calculate theoretical yield anyway, calculating theoretical yield for both of them and seeing which one's a lower number is not a, a bad approach here. So if we used up all of our titanium, and one mole of titanium is one mole of product. That math is really easy, right? So we have enough titanium to make 0 0.05 moles of product, 0 0.042 moles of fluorine, And for every two moles of fluorine, it's one mole of product. So 0 So right off the bat, that tells us two things. It gives us our theoretical yield in moles, and it tells us what's, what our limiting reactant is, right? We, have, we only have enough fluorine to make 0.02 moles of product. We have enough titanium to make 0.05 moles of product. Therefore, this is our theoretical yield in moles, and fluorine is our limiting reactant. All right, so if we want to figure out what our theoretical yield is in grams, that's pretty straightforward now, right? Once we know what our theoretical yield is in moles and we want to get to grams, another molecular weight problem. If we can make 0 0.021 moles of product and one mole product, is so we're just going to take our 0 0.021 multiply by 123.86 and that'll give us a, I was just trying to go change the color What do we get in grams? So we've got two of our four things done. While we're talking about the yield and the product, let's go ahead and finish percent yield. How are we gonna plug in percent yield? Actual over expected. Even if that gives you a number that's more than 100%. That's possible sometimes. Think about what we did in lab last week where we made that copper and then we dried it and then we weighed it. If we didn't wait for it to dry all the way, then we actually had some water mixed in there too, right? which means we could have gotten more than 100% yield pretty easily. That happens all the time in chemistry. Same thing, right? 
So showing your work would be showing times 100%, but if you're comfortable multiplying by 100 in your head, I'm fine with that too. Sure, yeah. Uh, so our percent yield in this case, we're gonna get 3.52 grams over 2.60 grams times 100. So we'll get something like, something like 140. How many sig figs do we have to keep? Three, so 135, good. So out of this whole problem, there's a, we've now spent you know, 12 minutes on it, lots of writing, lots of accidentally erasing, hopefully less erasing on your part. Um, none of the math is tricky at all, really, right? It's just putting it together in the right steps. The math is really simple, grade school stuff. Knowing how to piece it together the right way so that it makes sense and tells you something useful, that's the tricky part. And that's what takes practice and thinking about the logic of what we're doing, right? So I'm not trying to say that this is easy, but don't overthink the math side of things. If you think it's as simple as I should subtract these two numbers, it might be, right? Just because the math is simple doesn't mean that you're doing it wrong. All right. If we wanted to find excess re reactants, and remember reagent is just the old school way of saying reactant. Sometimes I still slip up and write reagent when I mean reactant. They're identical in my mind. They should be identical in your mind too. Um, so excess reagent, well, if we're running out of fluorine, there's no fluorine left, but we're not using all the titanium. This is another way you can get more than 100% yield is if you have some leftover reactant that you're weighing, assuming that it's product, but it's not really, it's leftover reactant. You could pretty easily wind up with, um, with a number over 100 that way as well. Um, a well-designed chemistry procedure involves some purification at the end to get rid of anything that's unreacted, but that's not always the case as we saw last week with the aluminum wire that might still be around, right? You get, we tried to pull the aluminum wire out at the end before we filtered it, but if you didn't do that step or you missed some, then you had some aluminum in your product too, right? And that could be adding weight that you didn't account for in these calculations. <clears throat> All right. If we want to figure out how much excess reactant we have in grams, at 0 0.050, 0 0.021. No, that's how much product means, 0 0.042. Not gonna erase everything. If we wanna know what the excess reactant is, we just have to figure out how much titanium we used and subtract it from how much we started with. So, if we know that we're using up all of our chlorine, And we're using up the titanium at a two to one ratio. So two moles of chlorine is one mole of titanium used. Zero point zero two one moles of titanium used. So to get our moles of titanium left. Subtract what you started with minus what you used. Moles initial minus 0 0.021 moles used or reacted or whatever qualitative word you want to use to describe this. So we're just going to get 0 0.029.
or excess. If we want our excess reactant in grams, just because we never actually measure anything in moles, right? So it's really common, probably the, the single most common calculation that any, any working chemist does is converting grams to moles. Because if you're doing the same exact reaction over and over and over again, you might do some of your more repetitive calculations to turn it into something simple like you take the grams you start with and you multiply by 0.35. And 0.35 binds a stoichiometry number with two different molecular weights. And it just turns it into one multiplier. But it's doing the same steps when you do something like that. Anytime you see a formula for something like I don't know, brewing beer. Oh, you just take your initial gravity and you multiply by this, and that gets you your, your alcohol by volume at the end. Um, it's almost always just combining a bunch of conversion factors into one multiplier. I find it more useful to actually write them out even if it's more writing because you can see what's going on. So if we have 0 0.029 moles of titanium left and we want it in grams, multiply by the molecular weight. 0 0.029 moles of titanium and one mole of titanium is, I just looked it up, was it 78 something? 47. 47. They'll get something around, I'm not going to do that. 1.5? One point four, and we're only keeping two sig base. All right, so again, knowing what these terms mean. In thinking about the logic of I'm making this or I'm using it, that is the trickiest part. Any questions about any of the individual steps? Anything that I got or I went too fast didn't make sense? And there's more practice. And there's even more practice. The only way these things get more complicated than what we did right here is if it's harder to get to moles for some reason. Maybe I don't give you a mass. Maybe I give you a volume and a density and you have to go volume, use the density to get to grams and then use a the molecular weight. Or if I give you a concentration, if I change up what the units are, that can make it look more tricky. It can add a couple of steps to your conversions, but the, in, the process doesn't change. Get it to moles, answer the question. Maybe turn it back from moles into grams or some other unit at the end. That's all there is to it, right? Always think about it in those terms. How do I get it to moles? And then do some stoichiometry. Let's look at this problem, at least the first two pieces of it. We're going to add one more thing if we have time. So here's one of those examples where, so that's drinking alcohol, ethanol. We don't typically measure liquids in mass units. We more commonly measure liquids in volume units. So if you want to figure out how many moles you have, you have to start by taking that volume unit and the density that's given and get it to grams. And then you can use the molecular weight to get to, to moles. So start by balancing, then get our 45 milliliters of pure ethanol into moles. And then we'll figure out how much oxygen is required to burn it all.
trickiest thing about the combustion reaction where you have some oxygens in your carbon material means that that affects balancing our oxygens, right? So now we actually have an odd number of oxygens on the left. We're used to balancing these with even number of oxygens on the left. So we actually want an odd number of oxygens on the right. So we wind up with two times two is four oxygen atoms plus another three is seven oxygen atoms. Sam? Yep. I was getting there. I was counting them. I stopped in the middle of balancing to make a point about that one still counts. Because there were a few people balancing on the quiz that missed that. That one, I think, was combustion of methanol, CH4O. Um, or maybe it was isopropyl alcohol. Um, either way, when there's an oxygen in the carbon material, that one still counts. So be careful with those. If I have 45 milliliters and I want to put that into moles, I'm going to start by going from milliliters into grams using the density. And then I'm going to go from grams and use the molecular weight to get to moles. C2H6O. Just for a rough real world comparison, 45 milliliters is one and a half ounces. So this is roughly, um, roughly looking at a shot of Everclear. In theory, Everclear is actually tastes better than, than cheap vodka, um, because it's a heck of a lot more pure than cheap vodka. Um, in practice, I don't recommend that. So 45.0 milliliters. We have a density, and remember density is let us convert from volumes into masses, right? So it's grams per milliliter. So for every one milliliter, is 0 0.79 grams. And then if you wanted, you can take that and use the molecular weight, do it all in one step. Molecular weight is going to be 24 plus 6 is 30 plus another 16, so 46 ish. 46.0. Just by adding in cases, two carbons, six hydrogens, one oxygen. Get something right around 0 0.76 or so. 7.7, seven, seven, give me one more. Oh, no, only two six days. Because density is a measured number, right? So 45 milliliters is a measured number, the molecular weight is a measured number, and the density is a measured number. Density only has two sig figs. So we're only keeping two sig figs when we round. Okay? That's the hardest part. The only thing different about this problem compared to the last problem is you had to do this step in, at the beginning before you could do a molecular weight step. So if we wanted to answer the second question, how many moles of oxygen are required to burn all of the reactants? Now we just use our stoichiometry step. We have 0.77 moles of C2H6O, and we want to know how much oxygen is required. We just do the conversion from 0.77 moles to moles of oxygen.
we keep using this word because in it and you know, write on it, it falls back and forth while I'm writing. It's really hard to not get easy, at least for me. Moles C two H six O, and we're figuring out how much oxygen we're using. So it's a three to one ratio. For every one mole C two H six O for ethanol, three moles of oxygen need to be used. You can write use you can write needed required. So 0.77 times three. 2.31. Then when we keep in two sig figs, the 2.3 moles of oxygen years. I'm going to leave the calculating the theoretical yield of CO2 in grams for if you want more practice. It should be something along the lines of seven point five, I think. No, that's light. Uh, Seventy five. 75 grams. Just if you're checking your answers, if you're trying to figure out how many grams of CO2. Which also seems a little bit weird because we'll actually, we actually find we're increasing the mass. We start with the mass, it's going to have a mass initially of, I don't know, around 40 grams. We're making some 75 grams of CO2 it's because we're adding oxygen to it, right? And oxygens are heavy. So when you burn something, you're actually making a more mass of CO2 than you started with because it's pulling that extra mass from the oxygen in the air. All right, so let's add one more unit that we can measure things in. That's a concentration unit. So concentration is a lot like density. It's basically how much of something do you have per volume? So in general, in general, concentration is equal to an amount over a volume. Um, and the only way that that really changes is if you change what those units are. Actually, I'll write it up here. Right, so what are some concentration units? What, what are ways we can measure amounts of something? If you're trying to describe a concentration to somebody, what are some things in everyday life that have a concentration? Juice, concentrate, right? Um, that has a concentration, but despite the use of the word concentrate, that's not a, it doesn't actually have concentration units involved in anywhere. Maybe I just did more drinking in my undergrad days than you guys do, but alcohol. Alcohol has <laughs> concentration units. What's the concentration unit on alcohol? Proof or more universally, alcohol by volume. Double EBV, you get proof, right? So that's alcohol by volume is volume 
of component A divided by volume total times 100 to make it a percentage. But that's a concentration unit. What else could we measure? If we're not measuring a volume of something, how else do we measure how much we have? Wait, Wait mass. So if we put mass units on top, that's still a concentration. So and this is one where, where orange juice actually is valid. If you had a mass of sugar per liter of orange juice, that'd be concentration. You want to say something like um, you make, um, you brine the turkey in a solution that is five grams of salt for every 15 grams of water. That's a concentration unit. Brines are really salty. Brining salt can be dangerous because it has some other salt, some other ionic compounds mixed in. Uh, I think especially for dogs, if I'm remembering correctly, I think it's worse for dogs than for humans. But yeah, you don't want to eat the brining salt or put the brining salt directly on your food. Um, I'm trying to think of what it is. It's something that's not all that dangerous on its own, but it's dangerous when it's concentrated, like when you have the salt. And it might be, might be potassium sulfate or something like that. Anyway, um, the other concentration unit that we use on a regular basis is rather than dealing with that extra step where we had to go from milliliters to grams, and then we could use our molecular weight, right? The easiest concentration unit just does it in moles. If you have moles per volume, instead of grams per volume or milliliters per volume, then that cuts out a step, doesn't it? We don't even need a molecular weight. And so that's actually the, the chemist's favorite concentration unit is capital M, which means moles per liter. So basically it's a, it's a straight up conversion that allows you to go right from a volume and convert it straight to moles. No molecular weight needed, even easier. So typically what we see in, in the lab is if it's a solid, we usually write down how, what mass we have of it and we use a molecular weight to get to moles. If it's a liquid, then we use a volume and to get to moles, we might need to, to use the density or it's a solution and we use something like this, a volume and a concentration. So if we want to take, if we have a volume and a concentration and we want to get to moles, we just have to remember that that, that was supposed to be underlining, not just crossing it out. Um, that M means moles per one liter of solution. So if you have two liters of solution and you want to know how many moles that is, you say, well, if I had one liter of solution, I had, I'd have 0 0.50 moles. Liters cancels liters, get 1.0 moles. And this unit is why we don't just use a capital M to represent moles as a unit, because capital M is the concentration unit. So if you want moles, you have to write MOL as your abbreviation, right? You, that's another one of those repetitive mistakes that I see every year is people write capital M to mean moles. Or even worse, they look at that and say it's 0.5 moles because it's got a capital M next to it. Capital M is the concentration, not the amount. All right, let's, let's do the, the uh, limiting reactants. Let's figure out what's gonna run out first for this reaction and then we'll call it for the day. So we just figured out this is 1.0 moles of HCl. 
how many moles of magnesium hydroxide do we have? What do we use to get there? Even if you don't have the answer yet. It's a mass. And we have a formula, right? Should start to be getting repetitive about now. If it hasn't been for the last half hour. If it's a mass, use the molecular weight. So 19.56 grams. And I looked it up earlier. I think magnesium hydroxide winds up being like 58 point something. And once again, that's just adding up the pieces. So two oxygens plus two hydrogens plus one magnesium. And get something right around a third. Zero point three. Now, how many sig figs are we going to keep? Good. So at this point, you might be able to see what's gonna run out first. And if you can't, write it out as a, as a stoichiometry step. We're using up the HCl twice as fast as the magnesium hydroxide, but we have more than twice as much HCl, right? Twice as much HCl would be right around 0.67 and we have one mole. So it looks like we're running out of the magnesium hydroxide first, but it's never a bad idea to show your work. So if we use all of our magnesium hydroxide, 0.335 four moles, every one mole magnesium hydroxide, is two moles HCl used. Zero point six seven eight. Six seven oh eight. So last thing before we go, think about logic. If we're using 0.67 moles of HCl and we have one mole of HCl, what runs out first? Magnesium hydroxide. When all the magnesium hydroxide is used up, we only use 0.67 moles of the HCl. And we have more than that. All right. Good job. I know. It's not the most riveting lecture, but um, we will do more problem solving with that and more practice with that. There will be a quiz this weekend that's just more practice, okay? Yeah. Okay. What exactly? So if you know that this is what's running out first, because we don't have an amount of oxygen, so we can just say, let's assume there's enough oxygen. Okay. So if you've got this many moles of, of ethanol, and every one mole of ethanol makes two moles yeah. of CO2, you can figure out how many moles of CO2 you can make, right? So if you have one whole mole of the ethanol, you have 0.77, right? Oh, there it is. So for every one mole, Thank you.
Sam, how's it going? It's going decent. I, uh, I was out of town and had like the materials to do stuff. Uh, okay. The help of this. A lot of this. Um, went through a bunch of practice with that and and um, defined some things with oxidation reactions last Monday, I think. Um, so you, that would be one to be to worth going over and probably watch the, the video because I think it's a lot of it's a lot of uh, defining vocab. Okay, so just go go through the, the video and just look at all the vocab. And it's, yeah. uh, week seven. This, this, this is week nine. nine. Okay, so I'll go back to the week eight. Week eight. Okay. Yeah. All right. And if you are following along today, then then you should be okay <laughs> with uh, and you can you know go take the quiz and and you should be should be fine. Gotcha. Okay. All right. All right. By the way, the cribs headlined. The cribs. The okay. Cribs. Was that were they good? They were decent. They're from the UK. They said okay. that they uh, they hadn't been there in like fifteen years, but they, they kind of just seemed like a modern UK sort of uh, new punk, I guess I could say. It's, yeah, sort of that new wavy yeah. stuff that came out yeah. in the late late two thousands, early pretty much the well, killers yeah, yeah, sort yeah, of yes, yes. yeah. Just, yeah. But but they were they were pretty good. Nice. Oh, yeah. Sounds fun. See you later. See ya. Yeah. The, the lab the post question now cool. right yeah. That was a year, I want to say. But so, sorry, what was your question? Oh, no, I was just telling you. Like, oh, yeah, no, yeah. this is fine. Okay, everybody else right. just turned it. Did you have the rest of it too? The, or you weren't here? Yeah, so this I weren't is here. Just, so I okay. Now. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, no problem.